Welcome back to another episode of My Favorite Thing. This week I will be going over Korahor, the Antichrist, and the Korahors that we face today. So in order to understand Korahor, I think it's important to remember who his predecessors were, who were his influential uh, people in the Book of Mormon. And as we go back to Jacob in chapter 7, we first encountered Sherem the first mention of a antichrist type personality in the Book of Mormon. And if we remember, Sherem tried to conquer with flattery. He used cunning devices and he used his learning to his advantage to take a w advantage of weak-minded and spiritually weak people. And his whole goal was to overthrow the doctrine of Christ. Fast forward to Alma chapter 1, and we encounter Nehor. He, instead of using his intelligence to his advantage, uses his strength. And he conquered by strength, bore down against the church, and if you remember, later Alma bears down in pure testimony to combat that. And Nehor played upon the pride of the members of the church. He used riches, honor, fame. Essentially, priestcraft was introduced to the church, that a priest should be popular and be supported by the people. And he introduced the doctrine of universal salvation. In other words, all mankind will be saved without fear or need of fear of trembling, because there was no sin in his doctrine. And because there was no sin, there was no need for repentance. And because there was no need for repentance, the atonement did not and could not be. And therefore, there was no need for Christ, thus making Nehor anti-Christ. His goal, remove Christ from religion. Amlicai, he follows the order of Nehor, and he has the same thing, the same goal, to destroy the church of God. So who is Korahor? Korahor is all three of them combined with even more. He attempts to introduce atheism on top of all three of these previous antichrists. So Korahor, he uses flattery and his worldly learning, just like Sherem. He uses his strength to bear down against the church he plays on the pride of its members, just like Nehor. But with his own flair, he perverts the way of the Lord by saying there is no Christ, there is no God, and that no man can know them. So let's read in Alma 30, verses, verses 12 through 18. And this Antichrist, whose name was Korahor, and the law could have no hold upon him, if you remember, Nehor was eventually brought down because of the law of the people. But Korahor played it smarter. He preached unto the people that there should be no Christ. And after this manner did he preach, saying, O ye that are bound down under a foolish and vain hope, why do ye yoke yourselves with such foolish things? Why do ye look for a Christ? For no man can know of anything which is to come. Hold on to that line. He himself says, No man can know of anything which is to come. Behold, these things which ye call prophecies, which ye say are handed down by holy prophets, behold, they are foolish traditions of your fathers. How do ye know of their surety? Behold, I say ye cannot know. Ye cannot know of things which ye do not see. Therefore, ye cannot know that there shall be a Christ. You look forward and say that you see a remission of your sins, but behold, it is the effect of a frenzied mind. And this derangement of your minds comes because of the traditions of your fathers, which lead you away into a belief of things which are not so. There could be no atonement made for the sins of men, but every man fared in this life according to the management of the creature. Every man prospered according to his genius, or Sherem, and that every man conquered according to his strength. 
Nihor. And whatsoever a man did was no crime. And that when a man was dead, that was the end thereof. So this is the doctrines of Korahor. Do you get the sense of what he tries to do, of how he tries to guilt and shame members of the church, attacking faith by blaming, shaming, and belittling? Let's look a little deeper at the approach of Korahor. Blame. He blames ancient priests, foolish fathers, frenzied minds, priests who do yoke, and an unknown God who reveals not himself. He then uses shame with words like, Ye yoke yourselves. Ye you cannot know what you cannot see. You are kept in ignorance. And then he belittles their faith by saying, you have a foolish hope. You believe in foolish traditions of your fathers, and these are a result of your frenzied minds, deranged minds. You follow traditions and dreams and visions and pretended mysteries and silly traditions. As always, the Book of Mormon is relevant and written for our day. The tactics of the adversary and those who wish to attack our faith are the same as Korahor in the Book of Mormon, only now they are intensified and magnified. If you have not yet had your faith attacked by the Korahors of today, you can bet that the time is coming. They have not changed much, but the attacks might still sound something like this. Your faith is nothing but the result of a frenzied mind. For ever since the church has been around, people have tried to explain away the existence of the Book of Mormon. At first they thought Joseph must have been copying from something else because he was too young too uninformed, too unlearned to have written a book like this. Other theories have said that he must have relied upon someone else to write the book for him and that he somehow got away with it. Neither of these have really held any weight or water because there's too many holes, there's no evidence for either. And I would say that the most prevalent argument made today is that Joseph Smith must have had some kind of frenzied mind or that he was a genius and that he was able to pick from the Bible and all sorts of sources and piece together the Book of Mormon in a way that seemed presentable. And basically the same argument is made that the Book of Mormon is the result of a frenzied mind. Now, I don't know about you, but the Book of Mormon to me is not the result of a frenzied or deranged mind. If anything, it's the result of a beautiful and well thought mind. The Book of Mormon, whoever wrote it, understood deeply and powerfully the atonement of Jesus Christ. Whoever wrote the Book of Mormon had first-hand experience with missionary work, with being let down, with struggling with the Spirit, with pleading with God for their brethren, with prayer, with faith, with disappointment. Whoever wrote the Book of Mormon understood what it was like to be a parent with wayward children, to be a brother who had adversarial family members. Whoever wrote the Book of Mormon understood what it was like firsthand to see the wars and trials of entire peoples. Whoever wrote the Book of Mormon had a beautiful mind because they have led me to have more faith in Christ and have exposed the devil and his tactics in my life. Korahor, in my opinion, has played on two emotions very, very well. He is going to try and 
get people angry and to by his anger he wants them to feel fear and then he also uses shame and mocking so let's go over anger first when Korahor tries to blame he's trying to anger or strike fear into the members this leads believers feeling ignorant fearful of being wronged and how he does this is that he blames people especially founders of their religion their foolish fathers ancient priests by blowing things way out of proportion and thus striking fear into the current members of the church his second tactic of shame or mocking is one that I know firsthand what that feels like and I think all of us know to some extent what that feels like when our faith is attacked in any way I've had my faith attacked it comes from many directions sometimes it's self-inflicted sometimes it comes from outside sources and unfortunately sometimes it comes from within family but I know that if if I left this these attacks on my faith unchecked I know how they le left me feeling. They left me feeling like I was somehow ignorant of the facts. That somehow I was blind to the history of my own church. That I was foolish for having been tricked all this time. I was fearful of being wrong. In other words, I felt shame, shame, shame. When someone belittles faith, it's really an attempt to reduce someone's beliefs to being absurd. Think of how that makes people feel. If you have felt this way, you are in good company. Christ himself was treated this way. And I would say that truth is always treated this way. Truth is something to be feared by those who stand to lose the most from it. Christ, as he was becoming more and more influential and powerful in his time, began to be feared by the Romans and by his own people, the Jews. And this fear caused them to ironically belittle him, make him out to be a nobody, that he was a carpenter's son. They spat upon him, mocked him, and eventually crucified him to try and eliminate the problem. Now, Korahor eventually goes on and is brought before the high priest of the land whose name was Gadona. And you'll see some of the same tactics used again as he speaks to this high priest and he attacks the authority figure of the church. In verses 23 through 28, the high priest's name was Gadona, and Korahor said unto him, because I do not teach the foolish traditions of your fathers, I do not teach this people to bind themselves down under the foolish ordinances and performances which are laid down by ancient priests to assert power and authority over them, to keep them in ignorance, that they may not lift up their heads, but be brought down according to thy words. Ye say that this people is a free people, Behold, I say they are in bondage. Ye say that those ancient prophecies are true. Behold, I say that ye do not know that they are true. Now, if you haven't heard this argument against the current church, that the authorities of the church are just trying to keep us bound down, keep us under their thumb, to keep power and authority over us, that's an argument that's very prevalent today, that the church uses its members, that it's just using us to become filthy, filthy, filthy rich, and that we are just blind sheep that will do and say whatever our authority figures tell us to do. Now, who would want to be a part of that? But when you step back, remove yourself from the attack, and think about your own personal experience with the church. Think about your own personal reasons for why you're willing to pay tithing to the church, why you pay fast offerings, 
why you listen and obey to the prophet's voice. Why is it that we're willing to spend so much time and effort and money in a church that we do it all freely and voluntarily? Is it because you feel pressured? Is it because you feel like the authorities want to keep you under their thumb? For me, I can only speak for me, but I have had free will and free choice all along the way. It's something that I choose to do. It's something that I choose freely, and I know that at any time, I could choose not to. Um, continuing on in verse 25, Ye say that this people is a guilty and a fallen people, because of the transgression of a parent. Behold, I say that a child is not guilty because of its parents. So there's some half-truth there. It's just like the second article of faith, that we believe all men will be punished for their own sins and not for the sins of Adam, of Adam's transgression, right? So there's some half-truth there, but that's not what Korahor is saying. He's saying that we are not guilty at all, that there was no fall. Therefore, no need for an atonement, no need for Christ, Antichrist. And ye also say Christ shall come, but behold, I say, ye do not know that there shall be a Christ. And ye say also that he shall be slain for the sins of the world. And thus ye lead away this people after the foolish traditions of your fathers. And according to your own desires, you keep them down. And ye, even as it were in bondage, that ye may glut yourselves with the labors of their hands, that they durst not look up with boldness, they durst not enjoy their rights and privileges. Yea, they durst not make use of that which is their own, lest they should offend their priests who do yoke them according to their desires, and have brought them to believe by the traditions and their dreams and their whims and their visions and their pretended mysteries, that they should, if they did not according to their words, offend some unknown being who they say is God, a being who never has been, is never been seen or known, who never was, nor ever will be. Now remember in verse 13, the line I told you to remember, that Korahor himself said that no man can know of anything which is to come. Fifteen verses later, he, put, he makes a bold prophecy himself, saying that God is a being who never has been, or never was, or never will be. That to me sounds like a prophecy, that he was able to look all the way back, present and future, and with confidence say that there is no God. How could you do that without knowing of things to come, or knowing of things as they were, or as they are? Korahor breaks his own doctrinal stand here by saying God never will be. I hope the lessons of Korahor translate to reality. I do these videos with the hope that as you're listening something actually clicks and makes sense and something can be applied to your life. Not just, not just doctrine but that you're able to actually say this book and this chapter has meaning in my life today. I hope it exposes the tactics of those who wish to destroy or attack our faith. That the mocking, blaming, shaming, and belittling, to me it takes me back to the premise of the Book of Mormon, back to the very beginning of Lehi's dream, where Lehi sees and vision the great and spacious building. To me, Korahor is physical and literal embodiment of the great and spacious building. Think of it. He plays on pride, worldliness, mocking, pointing. He has no foundation to stand on. So isn't it ironic as we think about those who are in the great and spacious building? Isn't it ironic how intently their eyes are fixed 
on the focus of of those who are standing at the tree it makes me think is there nothing else to look at or talk about while in the great and spacious building it's such a big and appealing and luring building was there really nothing better to do than mock those who stood at the tree to reinterpret the famous Neil A. Maxwell quote of those who leave the church can't leave the church alone can those who leave the tree not leave the tree alone so I want to go back to 1st Nephi 8 where we read of this Lehi's vision and we read of the great and spacious building and behold a great and spacious building stood as it were in the air high above the earth and it was filled with people both old and young male and female and their dress was exceedingly fine and they were in the attitude of mocking and pointing their fingers towards those who had come at and were partaking of the fruit and after they had tasted of the fruit they were ashamed because of those that were scoffing at them and they fell away into forbidden paths and were lost that's the the whole goal of Korahor to get people to feel ashamed fall away and become lost you and I should have no interest in becoming like that and be, being like those people the verses that apply to us who wish to keep our faith and stay at the tree is, be, is found in verse 30 Behold, there were other multitudes pressing forward, and they came hold and caught hold of the end of the iron rod, and they did press their way forward, continually holding fast to the rod of iron, until they came forth, fell down, and partook of the fruit of the tree. So the word of God is crucial to fighting off and staying, staying strong in our testimonies. We must cling to it. And then we must humbly fall down, be humble. And the best way to stay at the tree is to humble ourselves, remove any chance of leaving by falling to our knees. As you read these words in the Book of Mormon, especially here in the vision of Lehi, are these the words of a frenzied mind to you, a foolish tradition, the whim, vision, or dream of Joseph Smith? Or are these really, truly the word of God? I'll let you be the judge. And I think the Spirit will testify to you as I read from the book of Jude, the same principles taught in a different time and a different place. That the Spirit can bear witness as this second witness that these things are true. But beloved, remember the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ how that they told you that there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they who separate themselves, think of separating themselves from the tree, across the gulf into the great and spacious building. They are sensual, who have not the spirit. But you, beloved, build up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, and keep yourselves in the love of God. I want to keep myself in the love of God by remaining at the tree, which, which fruit.